Hi, my friends. Uh, Sam here with yet another solution pressure wrap video. Uh, you may you may want to watch this one at 2x because uh, it's a lot. Uh, I will admit I've been tiptoeing around this topic for a long time. Um, you know, is this a tourniquet? And today I am ready, I think, to take the plunge. Um, at last, I, I now say yes, it's a tourniquet. Uh, but that's not in a, in a binary sort of way. So to me, this is still a wrap. Um, these are still wraps that just do a ton of stuff and coincidentally are my favorite tourniquets too. Uh, I know I know this contradicts a video of mine from a few months back and um, where I explain that it's not a tourniquet, but just the more time goes by, the more I think I have to, I have to get up the guts and just own it. You know, it it's what people want to know most, it appears. When I send it to people, they put it on their arms and legs and test it in that way. So I feel like I have to uh, address that. Uh, and so in my previous video, I, I will admit, I wanted to set expectations low. And I also wanted to encourage people to, well, think of all the other ways that they could use these things. And, and frankly, I didn't want to trigger the stop the bleed community. You know, if you call something a tourniquet, you have to uh, really be confident that it works in that way. Um, and there's another factor. So I work with Rescue Essentials. I work with other companies. I know a lot of other tourniquet manufacturers and some of them are great friends of mine. And I just didn't want to be competing with those products. But, you know, this is about helping people and I just have to have to make my case here. So before doing a deep dive and making my case, I, I, I just want to mention something that I, I say pretty frequently. I talk about this all the time and that's bias and, and my own in particular. So we, we, we all see the world uh, through our own experiences and our own environments. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a soldier. I'm not a paramedic or police officer. I've never, I've never been shot at. I've never been uh, trying to stop bleeding while under fire. You know, I don't, I don't own a gun. I don't, but I don't, I don't begrudge people who do. I, I just, I, I, well, I begrudge people who use them poorly. Uh, so I'm an ER doc and in my job, you know, I, I don't actually do a lot of uh, saving of lives, but I do a lot of uh, relieving suffering. And so that's how I kind of see the world. It's a little bit different. I, I care a fair bit about diminishing pain and suffering. Um, and I'm also, and, and maybe this is a bigger factor, I'm, I'm a dad. I have a, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old and I'm, I'm living in this country where random shootings are, are pretty common, uh, disturbingly common. So I think about uh, leading controlling kids probably more than a lot of people. I do, I, I appreciate that um, people have an interest in stopping bleeding quickly. I think that's been a good shift through the years. When I did my residency, it was the ABC, so airway breathing circulation. And now there's a lot more focus on stopping massive hemorrhage first. And so that's a good thing. Uh, but towards, um, towards getting bleeding to stop, I don't love the way that we've pushed so much in the direction of tourniquets. I'm still maybe call me old school, but I'm a, you know, a direct pressure first kind of guy. A, a lot of my experiences with the, with the pressure wrap feel similar to my experiences with uh, traction splinting. So if you're not aware of this, I, I've spent even longer trying to improve traction splints. And in the early days, uh, you know, I saw traction splints that were out there and just bulky and difficult and <laughs> I, I tried to improve them and so I have a better product now. And, and this is how I feel about tourniquets today too. I just, I find them very, very painful and sometimes you can make people worse with them. So the goal of this, these wraps is to encourage direct pressure first. And if you need to migrate to making a tourniquet, that's an option with these too. So this is sort of a, a hybrid type of device. Uh, so, so for a long time, I've wanted to build a bleeding control device that's that's easier for the untrained as well, and it, you know something that's less painful and something that is finely adjustable, and also something that is just a lot better for kids. The cat works, and people will often say that they fit on kids, but is that the best way to stop bleeding in a kid? And I would argue, definitely not. <laughs> I direct pressure on small limbs is the way to go. And, and certainly on dogs, I can't imagine putting some, a windless device on a dog. You just don't need it. Direct pressure is the way to go. So, so this is my bias. Um, 
you know, regarding these wraps, you know, one, one of the most common questions that comes up is, are they COTSI approved? And, you know, sadly, they aren't. And, and well, they probably won't be anytime soon. Um, but I, I'm putting this out here for you to help you make decisions about tourniquets for yourself. You know, and, and I should say a few more words about COTSI. So COTSI is the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Um, and and they, COTSI is the, the elephant in the room of every tourniquet discussion. So if you say it's not COTSI approved or even COTSI recommended, then people sometimes just uh, close off their brains. Uh, so COTSI, this, this, is, this is a group of medical experts. And um, from all I can tell, they're, they're, they're good people. Um, they want to help people to stay alive longer. And they put together all kinds of recommendations based on their years of battlefield experience. And, and, and they do a lot of uh, reviews of the literature. Uh, they're they're US-based and they, and they strongly advocate for evidence-based medicine, which is, you know, it's hard to take issue with. Um, I can't speak for COTSI, but they, they do have their own bias. Um, they, they have a bias towards American-made products, and, but that makes sense. Uh, they are uh, trying to give recommendations for uh, the U.S. military in particular. So U.S. military wants products that will be uh, reliably sourced. So I, I should also say they, they would clarify, they don't do, they don't approve tourniquets. They, they recommend them, but they don't do tourniquet approvals. And, and they aren't, they aren't gorillas in a lab either. So I can't just send these to them and say, hey, would you please uh, review these and test them? You know, I'm hoping that some people who see this will be inspired to go ahead and you know, research these wraps and then go publish someday. But I, I, I think that might be a long time waiting. I, I know a lot of medical device people now, and, and for many years, I've watched them sort of clawing over each other to get a, you know, a thumbs up from Katsi. And that, that, that's fair enough, um, but it kind of sets up a, a catch-22 dynamic. They base their recommendations in part on real-world use and preferences, but, but if people only go with their recommendations, then how are you know, new tourniquets going to get tested in the real world, especially in any kind of numbers that matter? So. For these wraps, until some group buys thousands of them, and then uses them in a war, and then goes and publishes and on their their infrequent uses, um, and then that has to percolate up through the literature to get the Katsi to get a thumbs up. I, it's just going to take a long, long time. Okay, so that that is a, a long lead up, um, but I'm going to start making my case for why why these wraps are great great tourniquets, and um, and I'm going to I'm going to start this by going through some categories from a 2019 tourniquet review. I have many, many different points to go through here, but the first 10 will be from this review. All right, so number one, on the, on the topic of occlusion, after home tests on myself and you know high pressure testing, I, this was in my last video, I, I'm certain these wraps can hit pressures as high or higher than the Katsi favorites. I, I just, you know, I wasn't sure about it a few weeks ago, but now I have no doubt. That applies to up to about my own size leg. I can, without a doubt, stop bleeding in my own leg. Um, and it's trivial in my arms. I'm not a big guy though. So I, I don't have a, um, a linebacker's leg to test on right now, but these do seem to be neck and neck with the, the Katsi favorites. And they certainly um, provide more pressure than the SWAT T. So if the SWAT T gets to say tourniquet, then this these do as well. So I will admit, I still haven't worked out what's the, what's the gold standard pressure test uh, since you know so much depends on a victim's limb. You know how big is the limb, and also a lot depends on the brains and the biceps of their rescuers. Um, but that last video really convinced me that these are are competitive. I think they should add another category called occlusion ten minutes out. So it's one thing to stop bleeding, uh, arterial bleeding right away, but it's a lot different uh, to maintain stop bleeding over time. As blood pours out um, of other parts of the body, as pressures go down, there, you know, I think Kotzi tourniquets do worse. All right, so number two, speed to apply. Uh, they consider 10, 60 seconds to be pretty good, but I can easily get these applied in less than a minute. However, I think these, you know, tourniquet time trials aren't being done right. I think speed to apply should include direct pressure first, followed by tourniquet application. And these wraps being a hybrid allow that. So you start with direct pressure and then wrap proximally and make it tighter and tighter if needed. And, um, and in that case, you at least have helped somebody. Even if you don't completely stop arterial bleeding, 
you have done something better as opposed to make somebody worse. All right, so on the topic of ease of use, I I maintain that wrapping is it's just intuitive. Um, if I handed if I handed these wraps to a caveman, I bet they get it right. You know, it may not be pretty, it may not look perfect, but when people are bleeding, they want to put direct pressure over the wound, and then if you have a long elastic wrap, people will wrap. Uh, it may be something that's in the brainstem. I'm not sure, but um, you know, I remember a patient of mine. She her dialysis clot came loose and she had bleeding all over the place. And she showed up in triage with her son. And her son had taken a shirt and he wrapped it tight. And then he took another shirt, wrapped it tight, and then another shirt, wrapped it tight. And he actually got the job done. There was blood all over the place, but the bleeding had stopped. And wrapping did the trick. Um, so I, I built these with untrained civilians and my kids in mind, with the expectation that instructions would never get read. So Oh my God, bleeding, just wrap, nothing more to add. And so ease of use, these are easy. Uh, the number of steps, this is number four. So cinch, wrap, fasten. I mean, God, so you gotta be happy with that, right? So oh, number five, optimal pressure. As I said earlier, I'm certain you can deliver appropriate pressures with these. I, I, you know, I've done some pressure testing on my own and these land in the same realm with the Katsi favorites. All right, you know, complications. I. These haven't been around in a long time. I have no complications to report. So maybe that's uh, uh, one of the perks of being new on the scene. And then on the topic of safety scoring, tourniquets in general, they're class one devices and really pretty safe, uh, at least in the sense that you rarely get dinged for using them. Either you apply them to someone who may or may not have needed them and then get a medal for saving a life or they die and you tried. And that's the end of that. Uh, so really on the safety scoring level, I, I think about breakage and Frankly, it's just very hard to break these. You know, you're, you're, I don't see somebody pulling so hard that these snap and somebody gets hurt. Um, that being said, if you wrap these around somebody's neck, you can probably kill them better than you can with a lot of the Kotze favorites. So I'm not, I'm not really sure how Kotze would score that trade off. And then on the topic of combat and civilian usage reports, I, I got nothing. I got nothing in the literature yet. You know, we've sent about 3,000 of these to Ukraine, but they aren't writing back to say thanks. You know, if you ever have the opportunity to use these, please tell me, or better yet, go and publish, because that would be extremely helpful. But this is one of those major catch-22 barriers. On a side note, when when tourniquet makers claim 3,000 saves, or whatever number of saves they have, I, I, I generally raise a brow. I mean, you know, are these real-life saves? I mean, as in, would would someone have died if you didn't apply that tourniquet, and, you know, and they wouldn't have survived with direct pressure alone? It, it's very hard to define what a save is with, with tourniquets. On that, on a previous video I did, I looking at officer saves live uh, with tourniquet, I just think the vast majority of those examples would have been just fine with direct pressure. On the topic of user preference scores, I, well, you know, if I'm the only guy using these, then great, but obviously a lot more experience in the field is needed. You know, I think numerous US and foreign tourniquets are better than the cat now, but you know, because so many people have only trained with the cat, it's inevitable. It, it always wins this category. And again, this is another catch 22. You know, how many folks really get to trial 20 to 30 tourniquets out there in anger on bleeding patients where, you know, their personal experience based preferences are, are useful? I've seen this with traction splints too. You know, so many people have trained on the hair as well as the Sagers. And, you know, it would, it would cost for an agent when an agency is considering converting, it would cost them millions to train up new people. And, th and that's not crazy as a concern for an agency, but user preference or agency preference is irrelevant when you have an individual considering what's best for the individual. Category number 10 here. So, you know, th this frankly is the real killer. Um, these are made in Pakistan and by Muslims, but they're nice. They've been good to me. I like them and they make a good product. I don't have a thing against Muslims myself or Pakistan. Uh, if you feel anti-Pakistan, then you should take your appendicitis to, I don't know where, because you probably won't find any hospital in America that's not using Pakistan-made equipment. And, and frankly, I don't mind if, a, if some fraction of the income from these goes to help their country. Uh, they've had a rough few years, and I, I think it's, it's good that we have these connections with each other. Um, from a military perspective, it does make sense to purchase from U.S. sources, um, but frankly, it's not for a lack of trying on my part or being cheap either. I, I just can't find a company in the U.S. who makes even this kind of fabric. 
you know, if you're here in the US, you want to try it, please, you know, just, just give me a call. But let's go through a whole bunch of other categories that I think are, in some cases, even more important. So number 11, pain and injury. Regularly, I read posts that go something like this. You know, tourniquets are there to save your life, and they're going to hurt. Um, and I, my reply to that is horse water. That's what my grandfather Milton would say. Fair enough if you're being shot at, but otherwise, to me, that's just, you know, if you do karate, that, that is yellow belt level doctoring. Um, you know, the majority of what we do in medicine is try to relieve pain and suffering. And, and rarely are we really out there saving lives. So I actually think pain and tissue damage is a huge consideration. Um, you know, I, brown belt level doctors, they, they, they relieve suffering. And the black belts, I think, are the ones who can get patients to actually crack a smile and maybe even chuckle during their, their, worst, their worst days. So pain matters. From what I can tell, tourniquet pain isn't just one thing. I think it comes from actually four different sources. So you have superficial skin pinch. That's one big one. And then there's deep tissue constriction, ischemic time, and venous tourniquet time. So let's go through those four. On the topic of skin pinch, these wraps offer basically zero skin pinch. Um, I, that is one of the most noticeable things from these. And that differs drastically from the Kotsi favorites. On the topic of deep tissue injury, because you can wrap these and then back them off, you can limit deep tissue constriction pain quite a bit and injury as well. So, you know, I know a, I know a veteran, she, she lost her arm and she had a tourniquet applied. And th she says that the pain from the tourniquet higher up in her limb, uh, that hurt for over a year. So that was deep tissue injury. That was, that was not ischemic pain. It wasn't skin pinch. That was damage to nerves and other tissues deep in that arm. Um, if you crush nerves for a long time, they take a while to bounce back. People think, oh, well, you can go a couple of hours in the operating room without perfusion, you'll be fine. But those are well dialed in pneumatic wide tourniquets and not hyper cranked inelastic bands. Next category of pain, ischemia. So ischemia related pain comes from how long you have the tourniquet applied and how long your tissues go without oxygen. But because these are easy to back off or convert, you can shorten the ischemic time as well. And then lastly, and this, this source of pain I think is very underappreciated. If you lose arterial occlusion, uh, but you maintain venous occlusion, that is horrendously painful. And in this other experiment that I did, I can tell you that venous occlusion pain is absolutely brutal. And I think that's what's going on when patients lose their minds during transport. I think their limbs are basically blowing up like balloons and, and their veins are seeing pressures they've never felt before. When I pull this tight, what's gonna happen? So right now I'm closing off the venous circulation and I barely see anything there. It, it shows that the venous pressure is a lot lower than the arterial pressure. How about now? Oh, look at this, venous tourniquet. Right now I have a venous tourniquet and what's happening is blood is getting shoved uh, through the arterial system and it can't go back in the venous system. So the venous level is going up higher and higher and higher. Back so what's happening right now is these two systems are equilibrating. So right now, the venous and arterial systems are on their own. The heart isn't having any impact on anything. And so the level of the venous system is leveling off to the level of, of the arterial system. Arterial blood is very bright. It's, it's more red. Venous blood is deoxygenated and it's darker red. And it's becoming almost the same height as this side. So right now, what I'm gonna do, I am going to release and see what happens as I do this in the opposite direction. Oh, look at that, look at that. The arterial is coming back up. Arterial is coming back. So I have lost, I still have venous tourniquet. I no longer have arterial occlusion. Arterial flow is returning. And look at that. Now, it's, it's pretty obvious. And I definitely have a venous tourniquet right now. I can feel the flow. Yeah, it's very, actually quite painful right now. Flow back into my arm here. And I definitely have a venous tourniquet at this point. You can see it shooting up on that side and now once i release i don't have a venous tourniquet anymore you can yeah. see the blood coming back down on this side i have pulsation on that side now look at this the venous flow it's, it's definitely getting back to my heart again i have and it feels a lot better too i have a lot less pain in my arm but that, that leads to another very big point so number 12 in my mind elastic absolutely wins i think every inelastic tourniquet 
is inferior. So, you know, frequently patients with tourniquets applied, they come in with palpable pulses. And why is that? And it's not just, oh, what's going on here? That's terrible. That is a tourniquet failure. And you're actually making somebody worse in that scenario. So, you know, maybe it's poor training, more, maybe poor application. But I think more often it's because people use webbing-based tourniquets instead of elastic. And I did an experiment on that too. I, I think over time you have fabric that stretches too. Fabric and the stitching stretches out. So have a look at this experiment and, and see what you think. Point number 13 here. So easy to self-apply. This is talked about by tourniquet manufacturers and users all the time. Everybody puts it on their own arm, always the left arm, and they pull tight and see what they can do. But to me, this point is actually critical. And if you think about it, like every victim is always their closest first responder. And, and this, this slip sleeve in these wraps just makes self-application cake. It's it, that first cinch is tight, and then it's easy to wrap, wrap, wrap how you like. There's not a right way and a wrong way. It doesn't have to be pretty. Um, if, if you wrap it and flip it, this is not a problem. It just doesn't have to doesn't have to look great at the end of the day. It just has to start over the wound, slow down flow, and then you go tight if needed. And then also, number 14, there's no directionality to these. So if I put my arm through in this direction, it's equivalent to putting it through in this direction. It doesn't matter. So that's not the case for a lot of the Katsi favorites. And then it's... You know, as far as an entrapped limb goes, there's really no problem to use these for an entrapped limb too. I just, you, I basically create a second cinch. So, so I can make this thing, I, I loop through here. And then this becomes my loop. For an entrapped limb, there's nothing to clip, nothing to unclip here. There's no instructions needed, nothing, nothing to think about really. And, and if you want, you can skip cinching it too. You just wrap it around like you would with an ace wrap. It's just easy. And all right, number 16, the optimal uh, limb occlusion pressure. There, there, there's a formula that I see bad around sometimes. And you know, basically what this is saying is that the pressure needed to stop arterial flow is dependent on two things, the limb circumference and the width of the strap. So with the dedicated tourniquet, you are stuck with the width of that dedicated tourniquet because you got one wrap. With these, you have options. You can go narrow, you can go wide. With these wraps in general, you can start with a one and a half inch band and then make it four inches. I mean, five inches wide. These are these are options that you have. And so that can make it much more comfortable for the patient. And I think it's more effective too. And all right, so let's go to dimensions. So number 17, these are super compact and light. So these are less than 1.2 ounces, and that's a, that's a pretty high bar, or maybe a pretty low bar. In any case, I, I don't know any tourniquet that is uh, that weighs less. Maybe it's out there, but 1.2 is pretty good. And on the topic of being flexible, soft, I mean, I, these, I think, are as soft and flexible as anything out there. I, I in quotes, EDC, I every day carry these in my pockets all the time, and I barely know they're there. And even, even the case itself is soft and flexible. I, I honestly, why anybody would want a rigid tourniquet or a rigid case is just beyond me. Um, actually, I take that back. My, my kids, they love Batman and his tool belt. And so, you know, maybe the, the cool factor is something I need to consider. But for me, old guy, um, I want something soft, flexible, and something that I barely know is there. Number 19, rugged. These are extremely rugged. I can hang my 165 pounds from them and they don't break. I mean, you know, these, these Velcro tabs will, will pull free, but nobody's getting hurt because of that. The elastic itself is extremely strong and tough. And, you know, I've taken these in the ocean and used them over and over again, and, and they just don't seem to wear out even with salt water exposure. That being said, if they do get damaged, they survive all kinds of, of uh, injuries. You know, have a, have a look at this, this video that I did. I, frankly, I made this turn, this video as a bit of a parody of other uh, tourniquet testing videos that I see out there. I went into it not knowing what to expect, but came out of these tests and thought, dang, that is a tough tourniquet. Everybody, which one is more damage tolerant? And this is 45 pounds, that's 25 pounds. Everybody close. watch out, watch right. out. And now this one here, this is the one that we froze, we drove over, we put an arrow through it. What else did we do? We hung from Wait, it? Dad, we Dad, burned it! Do you still, we, 
<laughs> we burned it. That's right. Dead. A little bit at a time. Oh, it's not going. It's not going yet. So that's a ripped up fabric. This is holding tight. Holding tight. Are Take you, that. Can you believe this so far? Look at what's happening here. It's still holding. It's still holding. Hanging on by a thread. Ah. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to hit me. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And number 21. So these are a lot less first cinch dependent. Um, the, you know, the first cinch is critical with most tourniquets. If you don't make it tight enough, they might not work. Uh, however, these, you make that first cinch tight and, and then wrap, wrap, wrap. And as your, as your pucker level goes up, you can make it tighter as you're going. And, and then if you get to the end, if you have started with direct pressure over the wound, uh, then you're still making somebody better. You're slowing the flow. If you just go straight to a tourniquet and you make it tight, but you don't stop arterial flow, then you're actually making somebody worse. And so there's not there's not a hard endpoint at the end of these. You can still make them tighter as you're getting to the end of the wraps. And, that, and that's a fair bit different from all of the windless as well as ratcheting tourniquet designs. All right, do no harm. So even if bleeding does persist, you've still made someone better with these using direct pressure first. And if you skip direct pressure and you only stop venous flow, you're doing harm. So direct pressure first, that's my mantra if you haven't gotten that so far. All right, number 23, these are snackable. If I have one, I wrap, 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 make it tight. There's still some ooze, put another one right on top. You know, the tourniquet instructions are you apply one and then if you still have ongoing bleeding, you apply a second proximal to the first. You don't have to think about that here. You just put another one right on top. If you want to migrate proximally, that's fine. Or you can pile them high and wide and make one giant wrap if you like. All right. And then number 24, there's no need for fine dexterity. Uh, you know, applied, applied. I can, I can put these on with a bloody pinky. Right, number 25, I call this another feature. These are a blend of direct pressure as well as a tourniquet. These are kind of the, the, the Prius of bleeding control. I touched on this earlier, but most tourniquet demos exclude that direct pressure step. But to me, that step is critical. With these, you first apply direct pressure, migrate a couple inches proximal uh, for a tourniquet only if you need it. And, and really, I think the only time to go tight and narrow is for a partial or complete amputation uh, when those wounds are just enormous and it's life and death. Everything else, direct pressure, that's it. All right, and here's, here's a, a chart that shows that approach. Number 26. So direct pressure is cleaner too. Here's, here's a video that shows blood all over the place. And it would have been a lot cleaner if the guy started with direct pressure. And then number 27, less plastic. So, all right. Now you may call me a greenie here, but why, why do we need all these wrappers? You know, these things don't need to be sterile. The wrappers just slow you down. So I actually count no wrappers as a feature of these things. Have them out, play with them, test them, practice with them. Just zero reason to be shrink wrapping all of these tourniquets that are that are sold. Number 28, I don't have a blue trainer. By using your actual product, you aren't risking somebody. You can train with the real thing here. Uh, people have blue trainers so that they don't, I don't know, stretch out the real thing. You aren't going to cause so much damage that could threaten proper use someday. These will fray over time, and, and you'll be able to see that. Um, and then over time, probably they migrate to your trunk or maybe your tackle box, but, you know, and then over time also the, the rubber, that'll probably decay like your, your 1980s underwear, but they, they'll still offer some utility even then. So it's not, it's not a binary topic with these. And then all right, number, number 29, they are finally, you know, finally adjustable, not finally, they are finally, finally adjustable. <laughs> All right, so this is one of my biggest beefs with tourniquets, and especially the, the windless types of tourniquets. They have 180 degree set points, and I just it, it causes agony. So for every for every limb, there's a sweet spot where bleeding stops. And then every millimeter of mercury above that pressure is not doing anything. It's causing excess pain and tissue damage. So if you don't get to that point with your first windless turn and you still have some bleeding, then you have to crank it 180 agonizing degrees and with you know with these the optimal pressure is when bleeding stops and that's it and then after you have clotting and vasospasm it's okay to back them off a bit it's just a it's just a much kinder approach i think and i've seen some tourniquets out there where they where they've tried to have 
finer adjustability. I think I think Pax made a tourniquet with 90 degree set points. I don't know if that's still out there. Then the XAT is out there with finer adjustability. Uh, number 30, these are easy to convert. So conversion means um, taking them off. So everybody talks about the process of putting these things on and stopping bleeding. But in the emergency department, I'm in the spot of removing them. And fine adjustability makes removal just a lot safer and easier. Now, there's no need to cross yourself just before suddenly releasing a tourniquet. Is it gonna blow? Is it not gonna blow? With this, if you have direct pressure on, you can back it off gently, have a peek, see what's going on in there. And you know, with sudden release, you're basically sending this wave of blood down a, down a limb. And in that blood, you have dead cells and all kinds of stuff that's just flowing toward the heart and the lungs, liver, kidneys suboptimal. So to me, slow and controlled with pressure maintained over time over the wound, I think that's the way to go. Um, all right, number 31. These work in blood, dirt, underwater, snow. I mean, the hooks are just super tough. If, if anything, I get comments that the hooks hold too tight, so they're not tight enough. But even if there are no hooks at all, you can still tuck the end like you would with an ace wrap or a SWAT T. Number 32. These fit a wide range of limbs too. So I, do I need a dog related tourniquet or a human related and a large person tourniquet or a rhino tourniquet? I don't, you know, having a dedicated dog tourniquet is just crazy to me. Just like trekking poles and traction slints, I, I don't like gear that has a pediatric or medium, small, large, you know, sizing. These will cover a, a wide range of limb sizes. And then that leads to the cost. So if you're worried that your, your rhino is gaining weight, then buy two or three of these, and you're still you're still under the cost of most of the tourniquets that are out there. Um, and then that leads to this other topic. What if you, amazingly, have more than one limb injured? So if you do shell out for two or three of these, then you're prepared to deal with multi-limb trauma. But with the Katsi tourniquets, $25 to $40 per limb, there's no other way to slice it. But for $25 to $30, you can manage a bad injury in one hypertensive linebacker's leg by wrapping over and over and over again, or you can manage two or three limbs. Uh, all right, and then number 35, my kids can actually use these. They can't use most of the Katsi tourniquets. I mean, they, they like to think they can, but they can't. You know, honestly, it just, it makes me crazy to see kids getting taught to use windless designs in schools. I think it's, uh, you know, I don't think they're gonna get it right, part one, and I think it scares them, part two, and I think it's very painful, part three. I think these are way, way more appropriate for kids. And number 36. So, and, and you don't have to be an Eagle Scout to use these. There's no need to scare people with uh, stop the bleed type of lessons here. I, the way that I would prefer people to be taught about these, especially kids in schools, is listen, you know, bad things happen. If your friend falls off the monkey bars and they twist their ankle, put direct pressure on them. If you, if a bobcat comes running onto the, uh, the field, somebody gets bit and they're bleeding, direct pressure. If you have a bump on your head, direct pressure. That is as far as I think kids need to hear here. I don't think they need to hear if a guy with an assault rifle shows up at your school and mows down your whole classroom and you're still alive, then go ahead and get your guts up to put a tourniquet on. It's just... Seems wacky to me. All right. And then number 37, all of the other uses. So, you know, ankle sprains, fractures, uh, bumps, bruises, all of these things. And then the non-medical uses too. I can put my lumber on my car. I can use it as a dog leash. There's just so many different ways to use these things. So bottom line is I am, I am very biased. This is my favorite tourniquet. Please go out, do some research with these. Um, publish and make these evidence-based and um thanks very much for watching no offense to katsi and evidence-based medic medicine advocates but before evidence you have to have some nuts like me that go out and try to swim upstream for years um bang our heads against the wall for a little bit and um and build some stuff so all right be well be safe and uh that's all well, it, it matters how strong the patient is. That's right. If the patient is strong. Like, a, like as strong as me. As strong as you. They got to be as strong as you. That's right. Or stronger. Or, yeah.
and there we go. You see all of those hooks along the way really help to maintain the position. And then this last piece, oh, you're gonna do it yourself? Nice job. See that entrapped limb doesn't need a lot of dexterity, and but it does need some good teeth. All right, good job.